excuse me, little dog. Hi, right, guys. It is an absolutely nasty, just yuck kind of, uh, I don't know, it's a good day to uh, to slit your wrist, I think. Uh, it would be a fine way to celebrate this nasty, ugly day in the collapse of everything as I lick my chops to get the hell out of here. And it is Saturday, uh, October 14th, 2023. So uh, I have been dealing all day with these two grown men who uh, up in one of my tiny houses heard a, heard a mouse in their wall. They grabbed all of their stuff, their two dogs threw all of their stuff in their car and fled in terror into, <laughs> into the night because they heard a two-inch mouse uh, in the wall. You know, when I meet people this clueless, uh, you know, trying to think, what are these guys uh, going to do with the collapse of global industrial civilization when a two-inch mouse inside a wall sends two grown men fleeing in terror into the night to the safety of a, I don't know, some five-star hotel room. So I've been getting quite the laugh out of this. Of course, it cost me $172, but uh, other than that. So uh, in between dealing with all of that uh, hilarity as a <clears throat> vacation super host, I have actually found some time to go right here on the mainstream media, and these two articles right next to each other, right up, I don't know, maybe the ninth and tenth biggest stories on the planet. <clears throat> I'm just going to pretty much read these stories, and you can connect the dots between these two stories as the mainstream media chronicles the collapse of everything and we're going to start right here in our own shithole country with this no shit Sherlock uh, headline from the good old Associated Press in today's Yahoo News. Oh, this is my old buddy Seth Borenstein. As I say, Seth Borenstein is my favorite mainstream media collapsitarian. Uh, Seth gets some stuff in there that a lot of guys can't. So take it away once again, Seth Borenstein from Associated Press <clears throat> and explain this to, uh, to us. U.S. oil production hits all-time high, all-time high, conflicting conflicting with efforts to cut heat trapping pollution. And there you go. Now, of course, guys, this is an article about the frying pan of fossil fuels. Okay. They might touch on the fire of renewable energy, but we're going to talk about the frying pan of fossil fuels in these two stories. <clears throat> United States domestic oil production hit an all-time high last week, contrasting with efforts to slice heat-trapping carbon emissions by the Biden administration and world leaders. There you go. And it conflicts with oft-repeated Republican talking points of Joe Biden's, quote, war on American energy. There you go. Joe Biden declaring war on American energy as U.S. oil production 
hits an all-time high. More oil was drilled in the United States last week than in any week during Donald Trump's administration uh, or either one of the Bush administrations. Okay? We'll cut the crap about Joe Biden's war on energy. Joe Biden is not only a uh, corporate whore to the fossil fuel industry, which is what we're talking about in this article, he is also a corporate whore to uh, all of that unadulterated horseshit green energy. So while under Donald Trump we were looking at the frying pan under Joe Biden, we're looking at the frying pan, not or the fire, the frying pan and the fire. Uh, it makes no difference who is in the White House, but just so you know, I am voting for RFK because we have a moral imperative to steal votes from Donald Trump and Joe Biden. But let me get back to Seth. <clears throat> the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration, not the EIA, not to be confused with the IEA, the EIA, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, collects analyzes and disseminates independent and impartial energy information, not to be confused with the IEA, the International Energy Agency, which works with countries around the world to shape energy policies for a secure and sustainable future. So uh, both the uh, both the well OPEC, as I was talking about, both OPEC and the impartial energy information agency are both talking about how demand and assumedly supply of fossil fuels is going nowhere but up, up, up in 2024 and right on through as far as they can see for the next 20 years at least. The EIA and OPEC are in agreement and the IEA uh, is continuing to suggest that the global demand for oil is going to decrease uh, next year and pretty much every year for the next 20 years. Uh, anybody believing that crap out of the IEA, anyway, I'm, I'm not going to insult my intelligence. If you ever hear shit coming out of the IEA, throw it in the garbage can. Now, of course, the big question is, are these planet eaters going to be able to supply the demand for uh, oil and other fossil fuels next year and for the next 20 years? Well, obviously, as of last week, as of last week, the, the planet eaters were having no problem uh, supplying uh, record demand for oil. And uh, I personally see no sign that this is going to change anytime soon. But anyway, let's get back to Seth. <clears throat> the U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration reported that American oil production in the first week of October 2023 hit 13.2 million barrels per day, passing the previous record set in 2020 by 100,000 barrels. 
weekly domestic oil production has doubled, has doubled from the first week in October 2012 to now. So there you go. In the last 11 years, we have doubled the daily output of oil in the U.S. <clears throat> With the United Nations and scientists saying the world needs to cut carbon emissions from burning coal, oil, and natural gas by 43 percent by 2030 and down to zero or close to it by 2050, several developed countries across the world are dangerously producing more, not less, fossil fuels. Ha! Huh, do you think so? This is climate scientist Bill Hare, CEO of Climate Analytics, which helps track, uh, yeah, which helps track global actions and policies to curb climate change. That must be a pretty, uh, pretty easy job for Bill Hare. Take it away, Bill. Quote, <clears throat> continuing to expand oil and gas production, and I would think probably coal production in a lot of places, is hypocritical and not at all consistent with the global call to phase down fossil fuels. The U.S. support for expanded fossil fuel production will undermine global efforts to reduce emissions. Close quote. Do you think so? This is why uh, that 2023 will see the highest global emissions of greenhouse gases in history, which will, that record will fall in 2024. All right, but the U.S. is not alone in this. Hare pointed to Norway, Australia, the United Kingdom, and Canada, and adding France because of its support for the company Total Energies. And the designated president of upcoming climate negotiations heads the United Arab Emirates National Oil Company, which has also announced plans to boost drilling, you know, for more oil. Uh, this is MIT professor John Sturman, who founded Climate Interactive, uh, a, an organization that models future warming based on countries proposed actions. Take it away, Professor Sturman, quote, from ExxonMobil to Shell, from Guyana to the coast of Ivory, those with fossil resources seek to boost production and delay action to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, close quote. He said that path will lead to, quote, catastrophe. There you go. Stanford University climate scientist Rob Jackson, who heads the emissions tallying group Carbon, Global Carbon Project, said no country or company wants to cut oil and gas production if someone else is going to sell the oil anyway. Said Jackson, we are in a fossil trap. Close quote. Yes, we are a fossil trap. White House officials have long considered increased oil production inside the United States as a bridge, as a bridge to help soften the transition 
to renewable energy sources. Yes, I love that definition of a bridge. Sounds like a super highway going in the wrong direction to me. It sounds like a bridge to nowhere. Well, a bridge to catastrophe. Officials have closely tracked U.S. domestic production, noting that output has risen by an average of more than one million barrels per day over the past year. That is a very poorly worded sentence, uh, Seth. It, it, it sounds like he's saying that uh, the U.S. is pumping, where are we, uh, about 250 million barrels a day. Uh, anyway, that's not very poorly worded. It is evidence, well, what, whatever, uh, they, they, you know, whatever he was trying to say is evidence that many of the oil price increases reflect the policy choices of other countries, including Saudi Arabia, on what is a globally priced commodity. And Seth doesn't go into it here, but neither am I. The president of the U.S. has nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with setting the price of oil or a gallon of gas. Joe Biden or Donald Trump or RFK has no more control over the price of oil or a gallon of gas than I do, you do, or Sancho Panza does. If you ever hear any clueless moron Trump tard trying to tell you that it is Joe Biden's fault that the price of gas is where it is. You are talking to a clueless moron who does not know what they are talking about. But that's another rant for another day. <clears throat> the Biden administration has committed several hundred billions of dollars in government incentives for moving away from fossil fuels to limit the damage from climate change. Can you say moving from the frying pan to the fire, but it's not moving from the frying pan to the fire. It is adding a, the frying pan to the fire or the fire to the frying pan. <clears throat> just because, this is back to Seth, uh, uh, this is Samantha Gross, Director of Energy and S Energy Security and Climate at the Centrist Booking Institution, says that just because the United States is increasing oil production, that doesn't mean it won't phase down emissions. Huh. The clueless moron Samantha Gross from the Brookings Institution said, U.S. oil is less carbon intensive than other oil. An argument the UAE's oil company also makes said gross, said gross. <laughs> I love that name, Samantha Gross. <clears throat> Take it away. So long as oil is demanded, demand drives production. We need to change the whole system to reduce oil demand. Replacing oil and power production is a lot easier than replacing oil and transportation. We need changes in the transportation sector along with policies to reduce demand for transport. Yeah, right. Like teleworking, walkable neighborhoods, and good public transportation, close quote. The Energy Department's 
EIA in a separate document predicted global carbon emissions will rise, not plummet, through 2050. As uh, I mentioned this in my rant uh, about OPEC. So OPEC and the EIA both claiming uh both claiming that global carbon emissions will rise not plummet through 2050 and, and of course uh, the big question is uh that is if the planet eaters can meet the demand uh this is stanford's professor jackson quote if the e IA is right, we will add another trillion tons of CO2 pollution to the atmosphere by 2050 and millions of people will die. There is no other way to see it. Close quote. Republican senators and congressmen, including the House Energy and Commerce Committee, this year have continued to repeat the unadulterated horseshit phrase about Biden's war on American energy. Yes. Jared Bernstein, chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, pushed back on that horseshit last month. Said Bernstein, quote, there are thousands of available permits, you know, under Joe Biden. There are thousands of available permits, places where oil companies can drill. They have been highly profitable. They have been highly productive. So, I don't think that's the problem, what meaning that Biden's war on oil is the problem. No, the problem is Biden's rolling out the red carpet to oil companies is the problem. Stanford's Jackson said the Biden administration has swung back and forth on energy exploration, approving the massive Willow oil project in Alaska but canceling drilling permits in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. <clears throat> and climate analytics Hare said, quote, it is clear that the Biden administration is not running a war against fossil fuels, or if it is, it is a very unsuccessful war. <laughs> Close quote, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, that's the main story I wanted to talk about, but then we see this article right next to that one from an outfit called Futurism, and you can draw your own dots between the, uh, the U.S drilling more, producing more oil last week than any week in the history of our country to this one. Scientists say homes of billions on track to become uninhabitable. As Earth's temperature continues to rise, large amounts of land may soon become uninhabitable and the consequences, scientists say, will be life or death. According to, to a new analysis from researchers at Penn State and Purdue University, don't know if that uh, includes Michael Mann or not, if Earth's temperature climbs beyond one and a half degrees Celsius past pre-industrial levels, which would be roughly one more degree from its current temperature, billions of humans across vast swaths of the globe 
will be subject to heat so extreme that their bodies will no longer be able to naturally cool, leaving them at escalating risk of heat-induced illness and death. As heat waves become more common, intense, and longer lasting, quote, the question of breaching thermal limits becomes pressing, reads the paper which was published in the journal PNAS. That's the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences or something like that, and they have a, uh, a link to the full scientific report with all the 50 cent words in it. Ominously, the researchers add that if we continue on our current climate path, well, look, look at the last article I just read, future, quote, heat extremes will lie outside the bounds of past human experience and beyond current heat mitigation strategies for millions of people as otherwise known as sweating, sweating. In other words, if current climate trends continue, growing areas of the planet will become uninhabitable for their residents who could perish as the result of the extreme heat or otherwise be forced to flee. Do you think so? And then, of, of course, what they're talking about here is what uh, we call the wet bulb temperature where sweating uh, just does not save you uh, from uh, dying. Uh, they talk about that. We've all heard that. Getting back, uh, this is Matthew Huber, a Purdue professor and the director of the university's Institute for a Sustainable Future. Quote, the worst heat stress will occur in regions that are not wealthy and that are expected to experience rapid population growth huh, in the coming decades. As a result, billions of poor people, you know, those having seven kids and then just trying to feed their families, as a result, billions of people who never should be born will suffer and many could die, close quote. It is a horrifying prospect, and given that humans around the world are already experiencing the horrifying impacts of global warming-induced climate change, from fires to floods and more, it is not a difficult future to imagine. There you go. Okay. We are going to uh, we're going to read one comment from Jim. Take it away, Jim. It seems like they like to use the word billions freely. So the common theme here is population. Many thousands of years ago, people would just move when the climate wouldn't allow them to survive. Too many people means billions have to live where the climate does not suit them. Solution, stop 
having children. Oh, Jesus. This is real rocket science. Thank you, Jim. Solution. Stop having children. Stop it! I wonder how many of these clueless morons uh, of breeding age could read this story uh, and, and thousands like it, uh, roll their eyes and pull their pecker right out of their pants and go have 10 minutes of fun uh, with their little wife or girlfriend with her knickers down. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. These poor people, they're just trying to feed their families. Their families, they're just trying to feed their families. Don't be so mean to these poor people just trying to feed their families. But speaking of feeding my family, I notice my little dog. My little dog says, Pop, I am out of factory farmed chicken and it is time to head to Walmart so uh, I can do a little bush meat whacking in the aisles of Walmart and get Sancho Panza a factory farmed chicken so I can feed my family while I still can. My guys. Alright, little dog. We're heading to Walmart!